All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome once again. You are here with your Wednesday night webinar brought to you by NoCD. NoCD, a downloadable app you can get through Google Play or iOS. Please check us out. And if you're looking for teletherapy for OCD or hoarding or body-focused repetitive behaviors, say like trichotillomania or excoriation or any issues with ticks, Tourette's, something of that nature, we would be more than pleased to, to work with you and help you out. And uh, for those of you who are just looking for information about OCD, we also do our NoCD 411 sessions as well, too. And we would be absolutely pleased to provide you or family members or friends info. Or if you're a friend or a family member of somebody with OCD, but they're not quite ready yet for prime time therapy, there are people as well, too. So check us out at NoCD.com or download that app or Google Play or iOS. And we're available in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the UK. And we take insurance. So let's see what we can do so far for the evening. Uh, first of all, we have, oh, boy, everyone's coming up with fun names these days, and some of them aren't easy to pronounce. Scholastolases. Sure. Uh, how do you distinguish between not engaging and obsession and avoiding the obsession with regards to compulsive behaviors. So if there's an obsession that happens, you could engage it, right, and do a compulsion. You could try to avoid anything that triggers the obsession. If you have an obsession, you could distract yourself from it in some way. Or what I would like you to do, you could go and live your life even though that obsession is there. So I'm going to give you an example of that. I wish I could say your name properly, but I can't. But my example of that is going to be this. For the rest of this show, I hope the ceiling collapses upon me and then causes an electrical fire and burns down the house in which I am doing this webinar from right now. So that is, that is going to be my uh, hope for the rest of this webinar. And you could consider that to be an obsession. You know, what if that were to happen? And should I do some kind of compulsive behavior to try to neutralize it, which I will not do any compulsive behaviors to attempt to neutralize it whatsoever. I'm just going to allow that to be there. And I'm going to go on and do the show. And um, we'll, we'll remind each other now and then as we get closer to the end and we'll see if the collapse has actually occurred or not uh, on on the uh, on the live program. That's what I would say about living your life with an obsession, right? I'm not engaging in the obsession. I'm not doing anything to try to debate it. I'm not trying to make it go away. I'm absolutely welcoming it to be there. It is fine that the thought about the ceiling collapsing on me and an electrical fire starting in the house I am in right now um, is there. It, it doesn't interfere at all with my doing the show. And I'm going to keep doing the show uh, all the way through. Okay. And I'm also not avoiding it by trying to not tell anybody about it or not, or, or do any kind of distraction. I'm not going to take a couple of shots of, of uh, vodka or something like that during the show as a way to try to maybe lessen dealing with it a little bit or anything of that nature. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to just allow for that whole thing to be there and learn that I can absolutely, absolutely handle it. Okay. So that's what we're, that's what we're going to work. All right. How do you overcome shame when dealing with harm OCD? I wonder what there is to feel shame about. Now, OCD says there is shame in thoughts, right? You should feel shameful for thoughts and images and urges. But it is kind of interesting that you're having those thoughts and images and urges repeated because of OCD, right? Because of one of the messages that OCD loves to send to people, which is, hey, remember, don't think about whatever. Don't think about the ceiling collapsing on you during the show. Still haven't died yet, but we've, we've got 54 minutes to go. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, and 
there's a, a lot of, well, heck, everybody in the world experiences intrusive thoughts, right? So should all of us experience an intrusive thought when that thought involves harm, right? Because I've driven over bridges and thought, what if I just turn the wheel really hard and throw the car off the bridge and everybody in it goes flying into the river and drowns and does all those kinds of things. Or I've treated so many people now with, with harm OCD that if I'm driving and there's people crossing the street, I, in my head, can't help but assign a point value to them. Uh, as if, if I ran them over, they would be worth, you know, 40, 50 points, something in that nature. And I promise any of you, if you're, at the OCD Foundation conference and you're talking to me and we're on a staircase or an escalator, I will think about throwing you down the stairs because I've treated so many people who are afraid of what if they were to do that, that I can't take stairs or escalators anymore without thinking about that. So, uh, Cold Kaya, I'm wondering how much shame I should be feeling for having those thoughts and those images and those urges. Or is it is it just okay that I have them and I don't have to actually worry so much about them, right? OCD uses emotions against us. It uses guilt and shame and disgust and says, wow, look how horrible you feel for thinking. I mean, and if you, feel that horrible for thinking this thing. You must actually be a horrible person because only horrible people would think these things and feel like this, right? I mean, it just, it's, it's gross. It's disgusting. It's awful. It's horrible. How dare you, right? And that, of course, is an OCD ploy to do what? To get you to do more compulsions, right? Because OCD absolutely wants you to do more compulsion. And the more compulsions you do, the more you feed OCD. And OCD, you know, is, is, it's not a stupid disorder. It, it, it's, it's stupid itself, right? But it's not a stupid disorder. It, it learns that, oh, this is the emotion that gets cold Kaya to really do compulsions, then eh, that's the emotion we're really going to push on so that cold Kaya keeps on doing compulsions. So we'll make sure that we really bring about tons of shameful thoughts, quote unquote, shameful thoughts, because many people could have those same thoughts and feel no shame about them whatsoever. Right. But you do feel shame about them or OCD induces you to feel shame about them. And uh, then you do compulsions and then OCD is like, woohoo, we won. Yay. All right. Let's keep doing that again because that worked out really, really nicely. And um, we'll, we'll continue. We'll continue on with that. Okay. So in terms of how do you deal with it? <clears throat> I think what I want you to do is to recognize that you're being played by OCD. And Yes, you feel shame, but do you actually have to? And, and you might want to turn this around. Would you tell anyone else in the world who has the same thought, image, or urge that you do to, to feel the same level of shame that you do? And if the answer is no, which I'm going to bet that it is, why do you have to feel it? Right? Why do you have to do what OCD wants you to do? So keep that in mind. Sean says, I really struggle with avoidance behaviors. Is this a compulsion? How can I avoid avoidance? Yes, uh, it can. Uh, you know, I, I talk about compulsions, but I also talk in a broader sense about safety behaviors. And, and the five safety behaviors that are so very important to OCD are avoidance, reassurance, distraction, substance use, and compulsions. And so if you're doing really any of those five in relation to an obsession, well, then you're going to stay stuck in OCD, if that's the case. So how do you avoid avoidance? You do the opposite of avoidance, you engage, you go and you face the thing, you do the thing that's uncomfortable, you learn that you can handle it. Uh, that's really what it is. It's, 
it's the rule of opposites, as my friend Dave Carbonell likes to talk about. You, you absolutely go and do the opposite of what the OCD wants you to do. And by doing the opposite of what OCD wants you to do, what do you learn? Oh, I can handle that. I don't need to be so afraid of that. That, that isn't so bad, actually, whatsoever. Right? So, Sean, if, you're, if your first thought is to run away from something, I'd like you to think about what your second thought might be, which could very well be to go toward it, right? And to face it and learn that you can handle it. Because ultimately, that's where you want to go, is, is learning that you can handle something that's really uncomfortable. Trisha says, if I don't do a compulsion, it feels like there is something hanging over me, like unfinished business. It's hard to deal with. Any advice? Thanks. Yeah, that's the response prevention goal right there is to learn that you can handle that. OCD loves that feeling. OCD wants that feeling to be there because OCD wants you to complete it. It's almost like, hey, you've got one more stitch to, to finally finish this, uh, this Afghan. And if you don't complete this final stitch, it feels like the whole thing's just going to unravel and you're going to have to start all over again. So why not just do that one last thing? And, and we want you to leave that stitch open and we want you to recognize that that's not actually the case. That That's probably not what's going to happen. Uh, when you learn to live with the discomfort of something feeling incomplete, you'll start to feel better, right? But if it has to feel completed, well, then you have to ask yourself, what are you completing it for? Are you completing it for yourself or are you completing it for OCD? And the reality is you're, you're finishing the business for OCD, because when you do finish it, that's a compulsion. And of course, OCD loves what? OCD loves a compulsion, right? So I, I can't stress enough that every compulsion is food for obsessive compulsive disorder, right? I just, I can't stress that enough. If you, if you want to feed OCD, do compulsions. And if you want to starve OCD, stop doing compulsion compulsions. That's where the term no CD came from actually, right? No compulsive disorder, right? Stop doing compulsions because it turns out compulsions are the things that maintain the problem. And the therapy exposure and response prevention and the response prevention being the, the big key component here and the thing that people don't do uh, is the elimination of compulsions. Stop the typical response. Do something else instead of what you normally do and learn, oh, yes, I, I can handle that, right? I can deal with that. Interesting, another question on guilt and shame associated with harm OCD. So, yeah, we answered that already. But, you know, again, don't never underestimate the power of OCD to utilize any kind of emotion whatsoever to strong arm you into doing something that it wants you to do. Okay. Luna says, any advice about unwanted thoughts that appear as first person, like I'm wishing, et cetera, in magical thinking, religious OCD, especially at night, they're very hard to manage with exposures. Well, thank you, Luna, for reminding me that I am wishing for the ceiling to collapse upon me and the house to catch fire via a large electrical fire that will blow the whole place up. We'll add to it now and I will, I will turn crispy. Um, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, Luda. What, what about those? You know, uh, OCD will use anything that it can to get you to do a compulsion. So you'll have this, I'm wishing this. Like, oh, what a horrible thing to wish it. But I've just wished for the ceiling to collapse on me and to set me on fire with an electrical fire in front of all of you watching tonight. And we'll see. I've, I've got 45 minutes left to go now uh, to see if that actually happens. So we're, we're on a countdown, everyone. 45 minutes from now. Or it's just another way that OCD tries to get you and, and to get under your skin by saying, ooh, are you, are you wishing for that? Why? I mean... What a what an awful, terrible, horrible person you are for wishing for that. I mean, geez, who does that? I mean, what kind of person are you that you would wish for something to happen to people? My gosh, you better do a compulsion or else, you know, everyone's going to think how awful, horrible you are. People are going to know your thoughts and your images and your urges or, or you might just go do it because now you've put the word wish on it and, and that might make it even happen more, right? So, boy, you better do that compulsion. 
And and it's just all OCD trickery garbage again, where it's trying to get you to do what it wants you to do. And and everyone, what does it want you to do? It wants you to do a compulsion. And and boy, when you do a compulsion, OCD sure loves you and says, Oh, you know what, Luna, thank you. That was that was so nice of you to do that compulsion. And and in fact, it was so nice of you to do it that I'm going to have you do another one because now you're wishing for this. <laughs> and then you have to do it all over again and again and again and again. And blah, right? Or we say, all right, I'm wishing for the ceiling to collapse on me and for the house to burn down in a huge electrical fire in front of all of you and as I burn away. And uh, if it doesn't happen in 43 minutes, maybe we'll all recognize that my thoughts don't make things happen. But you might say, ah, maybe this time. But what if, what if the next time it does? And I will, I will take the same bet next time and the time after that and the time after that and the time after that and the time after that. Because uh, so far, this house has stood for almost 100 years now. and. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to take that bet. Do I have a guarantee? Nope. Will I ever? Nope. Do I have to have one to function and survive and live my life? Nope. Does OCD tell you you have to have one in order to function and live your life? Yep. And that's where OCD is a jerk. Because OCD says to you, no way to function without a guarantee. But not in your whole life, just in these one, two, three little areas. Everything else, totally fine if you have no guarantee. No worries, no issue whatsoever. And all those other, but this thing, ooh, this one, this one requires a guarantee. And I must, must have that guarantee. What a jerk OCD is, if that's the case, right? What an absolute jerk. Janelle says, existential OCD getting really anxious because your mind is questioning reality and having fears that people around you are not real. Your psychologist or psychiatrist said it could be psychosis OCD. Therapist does not. Uh, any tips? So, yeah, you know, the existential OCD can get you to doubt reality and question all sorts of things and wonder if what I'm experiencing is true or real and, and, if it isn't, does that mean I'm developing schizophrenia or some kind of psychotic disorder? And, and if I am developing some kind of psychotic disorder, what does that mean about me? And, and now I've read stories about people who have psychosis and why aren't they the ones who go and do awful and horrible things to people and, and like, you know, attack people or burn stuff down or anything like that. And, and then they, maybe they're homeless and, and is that going to be me? And, oh my gosh, it is. And my life's over. Ah, what do I do? What, how do I, how do I live? How do I handle this? And can anyone share with me, uh, please put it in the, uh, in the comments. Can anyone share with me a happy ending story that OCD has drawn up for you? Because right? so far, no one's ever walked in my office and said, Dr. McGrath, I'm afraid everybody loves me and thinks I'm awesome. I've treated nobody for that whatsoever. I'm, I'm still waiting, uh, but it, I, I just don't think it's going to happen in my career at all, that, that that's the way that it is going to go. And, um, you know, I, I think OCD just loves loves some doubt i mean it it wouldn't be nicknamed the doubting disorder if it didn't love some doubt so so whether janelle it's you're disconnected to reality or luna that your your magical thinking is going to have something happen and you're going to wish for something or or uh you know if we go up if we look at cheyenne and unacceptable thoughts and uncertainty and and uh Trisha feeling unfinished and Sean struggling with avoidance and sh we have shame from Coldfish and sorry, your unpronounceable <laughs> name about, about all this. I mean, th they all come down to the same thing. They all have a common theme. I don't care what type of OCD you have. They're all the same in the end. And that sameness is, what if this thing happens? 
What if I want this thing to happen? What if I wish for this thing to happen? Or I do wish for this thing to happen. And somehow the world goes to hell because of me, right? The poop hits the fan because of me and because I didn't do a compulsion. Well, I say this with all sincerity. I am not being sarcastic here. If compulsions were the things that made the world work better and, and keep it going, all of us would thank you for doing them. But you've probably noticed that your friends and your family really wish the OCD would go away because they don't find it to be anything additive to the relationship that they have with you. And therefore, as much as you maybe have convinced yourself that you're doing all these OCD things to save other people and keep yourself and everyone else safe, I think you know in the back of your head that's a lie. OCD would love you to believe that. The reality of it is it's just not true. Because if it was true, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, if it was true, my job would be to give OCD to people. It would be to go up to people who look like they're having a rough day and say, you know, looks like you're having a bit of a hard day. Have you considered some OCD? Might help you through this experience. Might make things better. And any of you with OCD watching this right now are like, please don't do that. Please, please. Right? But all of you hold on to a belief that, that I talk about a lot in the talks that I do, this notion of specialness. The rules of the world, though, apply to me differently than they do to everybody else. And it's fine if everybody else feels this way or thinks this thing, but it's not okay if I do. It works different for me than it does for everybody else. Another lie that you've fallen for. OCD has pulled the wool over your eyes. You're, you're so afraid of all the things that pop in your head and wondering what if they're true. But I'm going to give you a different what if to think about. What if OCD wasn't true? What if OCD was just a lie? Oh, but then if you tell me it's not OCD and I still have these thoughts, does that mean that I really like them or want them? Does that mean I'm psychotic? I'm an awful, horrible person. And I should be punished for my thoughts? No, then you're just a human who has intrusive thoughts. That's all that you are. Yeah, but there's people out there in the world who actually think things and then do things. Sure, there are. And, well, what if I become one of those people? We all could become one of those people at some point. It, it's a possibility. It is absolutely a possibility. We could all become one of those people. Likelihood, amazingly small, but a possibility. And part of living life is just living, knowing that there are possibilities that things could happen. And uh, we, we deal with that. We accept that. I have no guarantee when I get in the car, the next time I get in the car, that I'll live or die. I have no guarantee that maybe even the butterfly effect, right? What if I wave my hand now, which causes a breeze, which is enough to add to the breeze outside, which is enough to eventually catch on to a storm and, and is just enough that causes the tornado to form and wipe out. An entire community in rural America. And it's all because I did that and made a little bit of a breeze. It sounds ridiculous when you say it out loud, but OCD goes, hmm, that deserves about 78 hours of thought there. Um, let's consider that. Yes, maybe, maybe we should restrict all of our movement to make sure that no breeze is caused by us, so it could never butterfly affect any tornadoes that could occur in middle America. So, <clears throat> boy, that McGrath guy is really smart because now he's helped me to prevent danger from happening to people. 
please keep moving. In fact, everybody watching this, just start doing this. Make some breeze. All right, good. Yeah. Plus, I'm fanning the potential flames that occur when the ceiling collapses on me and there's flames all around from the electrical fire that now is uh, 34 minutes away. <laughs> Potentially. We'll see. Okay. <clears throat> Nicole says, Thanks for always doing these lives. Happy to do them. You've done ERP for 18 months and have seen a huge improvement. Wonderful. All your numbers are great. Awesome. Your main theme is was uh, psychosis OCD. Well, just what we we're talking about. Look at that. You're just curious about some things that uh, uptick now that your treatment is reduced and your OCD is calm. You're not really bothered by it. Just more curious. You're asking here because if your question can help someone else, you're in for it. Good. You've had an increase in brain zaps and sleep hallucinations, both falling asleep and waking up. Is there a correlation with the theme and these experiences? Uh, I've never heard of a correlation uh, on that whatsoever. Just so you, you haven't been on meds for OCD, so you never understood why I got brain zaps. I don't really know what brain zaps are, but I'd be fascinated to find out. Uh, can anything be done uh, for these experiences or is it just ride the wave type of thing? So I don't really know what a brain zap is, and I bet everybody I asked would give me a little bit different kind of description of it whatsoever. Could be a panicky kind of feeling or something of that nature, or just something that feels uncomfortable to you. Uh, I would say, you know, if you've talked to a medical person about it and they have no, no concern about it whatsoever, then we can move on and probably just take a look at the fact that uh, this might just be one of the ways that you experience anxiety, and therefore we can probably move on from it. Jen, yeah, how are you? Can I talk about why self-compassion is so important to the process? Well, if our friend Kim Quinlan was here, hi Kim, if you're listening, <coughs> she would give you lots of lectures on this with many exclamation points as well. But if, if you think about this notion that you are a bad person and you deserve punishment, OCD is gonna really pick up on that and go, mm, yeah. You know, only bad people think these kinds of things. And geez, what a what a really horrible bad person you are for even having some of these thoughts. And so um, why would we want some self-compassion? Because we want to allow ourselves the, the grace to recognize that, hey, every single human being experiences wacky thoughts, wacky images, wacky urges. And that that is a normal, natural human experience. OCD doesn't like my definition being a normal, natural human experience. OCD wants it to be awful and horrible and just self-blaming, right? Because OCD's belief is you can punish yourself out of thinking something. So it reminds me of one of my favorite phrases, uh, that that is in in one of those funny motivational posters. The beatings will stop when morale improves, and that that would be a slogan that OCD would love, right? Hey, we'll stop beating you up so much when you get better. You think that that's going to make things better by ripping everybody down and tearing everybody apart? Well, we know from research it doesn't actually. And so all it does is actually make things worse. So OCD is using a guaranteed method to make things worse. Never better. And I hope that you would allow yourself some self-compassion. I hope that you would allow yourself some grace in recognizing that you are a human being who experiences intrusive thoughts, images, and urges just like the rest of us do, but that you have a condition that also leads you to believe something about those that most other people do not, do not which is that they actually have meaning and importance and are threatening and bad and awful and horrible versus the rest of people who go, well, that was weird, and move on. We are halfway through our very fun Wednesday night webinar, as we do on Wednesday evenings. Great to be here with all of you. This is the No CD Wednesday night webinar, and No CD is a downloadable app you can get through Google Play or iOS. Check us out. 
And we do teletherapy for obsessive compulsive disorder. So if you're looking for teletherapy in the United States or Canada or the UK or Australia, we are available to you. So please check us out at nocd.com. You can set up for a free 15-minute appointment with one of our care team members. We would love to chat with you. People are available all the time. And uh, if, if we're busy, we'll call you back. Just leave a number. We'll, we'll get back right to you, I promise. And let's see if we can help you out uh, so that you don't have to have this nasty old OCD or hoarding or BFRBs or ticks hanging over your head anymore. And if you're just looking for information about OCD, we would absolutely love to also give you that information as well, too. We do lots of fun stuff uh, here at, at NoCD. And one of them that I really enjoy is educating families and friends about OCD, especially of people who who uh, are related or, or just want to know what they can do to support somebody with OCD who might not quite be ready for therapy. So always enjoy doing those. Victoria says, oh my God, I hope that means, wow, this is an amazing, amazing webinar and and everyone should watch it. I hope that's what your OMG says. So. Uh, Captain says, do I have tips for motivation with ERP? You're tired, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, I'll, I'll ask you one question, Kent. How motivated are you to stay the same versus how motivated are you to change? If you are more motivated to stay the same, to stay the course, to do what OCD wants you to do, then that is what is going to happen. And you will not change. You will stay the same. Versus if you're motivated to live the life that you want to live and not the life that OCD wants you to live, then you will change. Now, that's very simple to say that, right? Because think of people who struggle with maybe giving up substances or who struggle with weight or things and, and how difficult it is to start that new process of not buying the substances and going to the gym and all of those things and how amazingly hard that can be for so many people, right? But you might be what I call a 4951. If you're 49% wanting to change and 51% wanting to stay the same, you're going to stay the same. But if I can just you get you to be a 5149 to be 51% wanting to change and 49% wanting to stay the same, then we've tilted you in the right direction and we can start that ball rolling down the hill. And it's going to be a slow roll at first and that's okay because it's still going in the direction that we want it to go. And that's what I would hope for you, Captain, is to have that happen, to do that. Lillian asks, any advice for existential OCD? It's been really awful for you lately. We talked a little bit about it already uh, at the beginning with the notion that, yes, you will doubt reality and all sorts of things about it and wonder all sorts of whys and hows. And OCD loves to ask an unanswerable question that philosophers have, have debated for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, but OCD says, it's fine that all those crusty old you know, guys were debating all those things, but you should have the answer. So then you should be better than all the philosophers that have been out there debating these things and all their followers and all the PhDs in philosophy and everything. No, you're the one who has to figure everything out. But what if it's unfigureoutable? Trademark that word, by the way. What if that's unfigureoutable? Uh, it might just be. Right. So maybe the job isn't to do what OCD wants you to do, which is to figure it out. And maybe the job is to be able to say, hmm, interesting perspective, won't ever know, cool with that, moving on and living again the life you want to live and not the life your OCD wants you to. 25 more minutes till the ceiling collapses and the fire occurs, everyone, just so you know, just want to keep, uh, keep announcing that. All right. All right. Um, Chester says you need help with alcohol. Well, here's the thing I'm always going to suggest. Do that under the supervision of a person who really knows what to do and how to help that, right? Do not just stop drinking if you are drinking a lot. It will cause a seizure potentially, and it could cause death. And you are not, not going to be able to handle 
uh, those things on your own, right? I mean, obviously, you don't want to handle death on your own. That's not very fun. But a seizure would be really, really rough too on your own. So if you are thinking about stopping alcohol, please do it under the direction of a supervisor, uh, of a professional who can supervise you in the whole process because it can be really, really tough to do. Jenna Liz says, I have relationship OCD. What are some ERP exercises that I can do? First of all, it's going to really involve your partner as well, too. And it's probably going to involve you having a discussion with your partner and you two setting up a worry journal. And this is one of my favorite exercises to give to people. Consider doing this. Get a notebook, write the title worry journal on it. I always call it worry. It could be obsession journal, whatever, but I, I've just always called it a worry journal for 20 years now. And anytime you ask your partner a question about your relationship that you've already asked already, your partner is to write that question down and then write down the answer. And if you ever ask it again, they just point to the worry journal and say, that's in the journal. We are no longer discussing that question because you already have the answer. Now, you might say, well, isn't the journal then going to become a compulsion? Uh, maybe for a day, but you're going to memorize everything that's in the journal, and then you're never going to look at the journal again, and so you're just going to get frustrated. Well, at least your OCD is going to get frustrated. Like, no, no, but I really I would need to ask you. I, 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 I thought of a different angle of the question or a new way to think about it or something. It's in the journal. We're, we're not going down there. The more that you and your partner discuss things about your relationship, the harder your relationship becomes for you. I'm sure you've noticed that over time. For any of you with relationship OCD, have any of you ever asked enough questions and gotten to the point of, oh, you know what? Well, wow, look at that. I've now asked all the questions. I have all the answers. <laughs> hey, hey, hon, we're good. We're good now. Our relationship's awesome. It's great. Look, no, no more no more doubts, no more questions. We've we've asked all the questions. We've gotten all the answers. Congratulations. Now let's go celebrate our relationship. Well, you may feel better about that, but I'm going to guarantee the person you've asked all these questions to is going to be like, really? 17 years of asking me questions and doubting me, and now suddenly everything's great? No. Mm -mm. Don't work that way, right? So just, just, uh, just kind of recognize the fact that in relationship OCD, your relationship never wins because it always loses out to another person's or the idea of another person's, right? And um, I always love the notion of never winning something. Like imagine if I opened a university and said to you, gentle is welcome to McGrath University. Keep coming to class. You'll never graduate. Just so you know, no one ever does. No one ever will. But keep coming anyway. Keep trying. But you're never going. Right? You'd be like, this university sucks. I'm out of here. But when it's OCD, you're like, ooh, more questions? Oh, okay. Well, yeah, let, let's let's do it. Yeah, because obviously it's going to lead to something. And I'm telling you, it leads to nothing. It is Charlie Brown and Lucy and Lucy holding the football. And no matter how time, many times he runs at it, bam, she pulls the football up. He goes flying through the air and lands on his back screaming, ah! Boom. And then says, rats. Every single time. And that's what OCD does to you. Every single time. Vanessa says, how do you decipher what should be an actual anxiety or something that is an intrusive thought? I'm afraid that I'll label something as intrusive and then something bad will happen. That's an OCD question right there that you would even have to figure out how to label anything like that. People without OCD don't care. They just experience these things and are like, all right, that was weird. And then they move on. They don't sit there and go, now, I wonder if that was an anxious thought or if that was an intrusive thought. Let me pare that down now and see. Hmm. What would make it intrusive versus what would make me anxious about that? Well, here's the list of the pros and cons of it being anxious. And here's the list of the pros and cons being intrusive. And uh, wow, there's a lot to take there. 
I'll need another 78 hours to think about this. And OCD is like, oh, that's awesome. We love another 78 hours of thought about this. This would be absolutely wonderful. Yes, let's do that. Let's let's absolutely do that. Let's go for another 78 hours. How, how great is that? So Vanessa, maybe the uh, the actual issue here is if something is dangerous and activates your fight, flight, or freeze response, you're not gonna think about it. You're just gonna do one of a couple of things, right? You're gonna fight, flight, or freeze. And that's what you're gonna do. But what happens in OCD, yeah, there's that activation there slightly, but there's also other th things like guilt and shame and disgust, right? So you don't you don't flight right away. You kind of stick around and wonder why and, and then, Get this idea of well, maybe some research and investigation in this would be a good thing and, and all this kind of stuff. But the fear that you'll label something as intrusive and then something bad will happen, well, that's doubt. And what does OCD love doubt? OCD is now going to get you to wonder, yeah, what if I what if I dismiss something as OCD, but it's really actually dangerous? And then the bad thing happens. And now because I dismissed it as, as intrusive, but it was really dangerous, it's my fault that it happened. Boy, does OCD love something like that. I mean, that is just a classic OCD thought right there that it's going to go to. But it's another what if kind of experience there, right? So people without OCD, again, don't debate in their head, was that anxiety or intrusive? They just kind of go with it and they react to it and they move on. It's the extra thinking and researching and everything in OCD that happens that really leads us to know where OCD is. And this question is therefore an absolutely OCD based question versus what everyone else who wouldn't have OCD would be experiencing. Hebride says, why does OCD target the things that mean the most to us? Well, that's that's pretty simple, actually. OCD would absolutely, absolutely want to screw with the things that are most important to us because, guess what? We'll put our most time and effort into that. It'll really hook us. Now imagine if OCD caught onto something that you don't care about. Hey! Your hands are dirty, and you're like, eh, whatever, and you moved on. No city be like, <laughs> hey, you might have run a child over. <laughs> Holy moly. Jeez. All right, turn around. Turn around. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Oh, hurting children appears to be something you're passionate about. Mm. What if you actually wanted to hurt a child? Maybe you do. Why would you have thought about it if you don't really want to? 78 more hours of this, we're going to get to the bottom of it. That's why. If OCD cared about things that you don't care about, OCD doesn't exist. OCD has to care about things you care about because, well, that's what you're going to give the most attention to. Catherine says, I just had my first session with no CD. Awesome, this morning, and you're really anxious about getting treatment. Any advice? Everybody's going to be anxious about getting treatment, right? Because change is difficult. And any time that we start to change something, it feels very uncomfortable and very different. But recognize this, Catherine. Living with OCD for the rest of your life would also be very uncomfortable and very difficult, too. So would you like the you know, difficulty and discomfort of keeping OCD around forever? Or would you like the difficulty and discomfort of trying something different and maybe actually getting better? Right? The therapy way offers you an opportunity to be wetter, be, be, wetter, <laughs> be better. The OCD uh, way offers you just sticking with OCD, right? So there you go. You could be better or you could stay the same. Which would you like? Brandon asked if I would have read Chris Palmer's work. Uh, no, I have not, but I'll have to take a look at it. So thank you, Brandon. I'll check it out. Ahmad says, I have pure OCD. As far as I know, your approach to trying to, as, so as far as I know, your approach trying to stop the compulsions um, and then an exclamation point. So 
Uh, I don't see anything else, so I, I don't have anything else to say. Now. Sorry. Eva says, what are some mental compulsions and or uncommon compulsions that tend to go unnoticed? Uh, sometimes people don't realize that saying a prayer can be a compulsion. So if you have scrupulosity and every time you have an intrusive thought, you say a prayer to neutralize it, it's not actually a prayer, it's a compulsion because that prayer is being done not to commune with any kind of higher power. That prayer is being done to neutralize the obsession. So if you're saying a prayer to neutralize an obsession, it's a compulsion. It's not actually a prayer, just so you know, because it doesn't meet the definition of what would happen during a prayer, which was the ability or the attempt to commune with some kind of higher power. So that would be one of the more common ones. And I would just uh, even watch, you know, do you drive one way? Because if you drive another way, there's a trigger there. So you always just take one route instead of going the other route. Even if the other route's faster, you always go that other way to avoid some kind of trigger or something like that. Or uh, just all those subtle safety behaviors, any kind of avoidance, reassurance, distraction is, is there. Um, are you, are you without knowing it using more substances on certain days when you're stressed? So maybe there's a substance use that's going on and uh, you know, all those different kinds of compulsions that happen. So really keep an eye out Eva for all of the various subtle safety behaviors that could be occurring. Uh, just so you all know, we are now 13 minutes away from the ceiling collapsing on me and the house burning down. Just so you know. Food High says, when I was younger, I used to have uh, set up your room in a certain way before you went to sleep every night. Was that another form of OCD or not? Could be. I mean, if you have OCD now, that might have been one of your first manifestations of things had to be in a certain order or else you felt that you wouldn't be able to sleep if they weren't. And so it had to be just right or perfect. So that could be a sign of just right OCD. Absolutely. Catherine says, does anyone else have contamination OCD in specific related to being allergic? I'm going to bet there's lots of people that are going to reply to that there. Uh, Timur says, what are some exposures for obsessions about intrusive thoughts while high? Well, you know, there's a couple of things maybe to talk about here. First of all, sometimes people think using marijuana or other things that get them high will be helpful. But I've also met a lot of people who can attribute their first experiences in OCD and intrusive thoughts to their first usage of some kind of chemicals that they were using. So I never recommend the use of, of uh, un prescribed chemicals as a way to kind of help manage anxiety or stress because I've seen just way too many people who took it hoping that it would help them with stress actually cause them to have uh, some quite paranoid types of thoughts or feelings and that led to uh, other difficulties one being obsessive compulsive disorder in some folks that were very very hard to handle so uh if you're noticing that you're only getting intrusive thoughts while high, then I would maybe suggest let's work on not getting high and then you won't have those intrusive thoughts, right? Because uh, why would you do something that's going to contribute to more intrusive thoughts instead of less? So, Timor, that would be some things just to think about. Uh, Caitlin says, just want to share a strange win. Okay, found out at 32. You really am a compulsive, you really are a compulsive hand washer. Denial is interesting. Do most people deal with OCD uh, and have a lot of denial? Yes. Uh, in fact, very often there are, and there's studies out there that show it can take up to sometimes 17 years for people who have OCD symptoms to finally uh, get diagnosed or meet somebody who actually knows how to treat obsessive compulsive disorder. So not uncommon at all. Not uncommon at all. Michaela, your eight-year-old has your first session tomorrow, mostly contamination OCD. Michaela, all the best to you. We, we wish everything awesome to you and your eight-year-old and, uh, and be a part of that, Michaela, because you're going to play a role also in helping them deal with their anxiety as they navigate not doing their compulsions, right? Remember, those compulsions feel good in the moment, but in the long run don't do much for us, but they do feel good in the moment. So asking somebody not to do it does mean that we're asking them to live with some discomfort for a bit. Lolly says, hi, Doc. I had a question about new thoughts constantly popping in your head, such as saying things like, I don't mean, and they're not just what ifs, and they're more like things you say in your mind that you get fear from them. Kind of like my statement, 
the ceiling's going to collapse on me by the end of the show, which will be in nine and a half minutes now. And there will be a massive electrical fire that will happen and I will burn in the fire. Like that, Lally? Maybe? Where I just make things up and say them in my head? Or, hey, within the next nine minutes, I could also run across the street with a Molotov cocktail and throw it at my neighbor Dave's house. Then go into the middle of the street, poop in a bag, light it on fire, put him in the front of my neighbor Josh's house, ring the doorbell. He comes out, sees the fire, stomps on it. He gets flaming poop on his shoe. I laugh at him. And then I shoot a few geese that are flying over my house that are going to the pond behind my house. And then I come back and I finish the webinar. Would those be the kinds of wacky, interesting thoughts that pop into your head uh, that you're talking about there that are not what if thoughts uh, that I'm just thinking about doing? And would those be things that now that I've thought them, you believe, Lolly, that I should do something about it or the authority should be called on me just to make sure that I do not actually go and do those things? Or, for all of us, are we willing just to accept the fact that wacky things pop into our heads now and then and we can live with that, we can deal with that, we can handle that and we don't have to do anything about it whatsoever? OCD says that's not true. You can't live with it. You can't deal with it. You must do something about it because if you don't and it happens, it's your fault because you didn't do the thing to stop making it happen. And I don't want you to listen to OCD because OCD is a stupid liar. I want you to listen to everything but OCD. I want you to challenge things and recognize that you can handle stuff far better than you've ever given yourself credit. Santi says, does real event OCD skew the event that took place? How can I move on from the past mistake, even though I feel horrible? Well, Santi, none of us are immune from making mistakes in life, and every one of us have done things that we probably feel somewhat horrible about. So, you know, that being said, just because we feel awful and horrible about something doesn't mean that we have to continuously punish ourselves for it as well, too. You know, um, and, and if you're doubting that, then Everyone you know who also has done anything stupid, every time you see them and you say hi to them, say, hey, good to see you. Remember that stupid thing you did that one time? And see if they'll ever want to speak to you ever again for the rest of your life if all you do is bring that up every time that you see them, right? Now, the answer will be no. They will want nothing to do with you whatsoever. They're like, that damn Santi just drives me crazy with reminding me all the shit that I did in my life and I want nothing to do with it whatsoever and I'm just done talking to Sandy because I don't want to be reminded of that stuff all the time. Yeah, I did some dumb stuff. Yeah, I paid the price for it. Yeah, I made some mistakes. Yes, I've apologized for some things. You're, there's still some things I maybe do need to apologize for. You know what I don't need? Constant reminder of it. Heck with Santi, I'm done. That's probably what would happen if your friends were to interact with you and you were reminding them of every bad thing that ever happened. So I'm wondering, Santi, why do you need to be constantly reminded of it? Why do you need to be constantly beaten up over the thing? Or do you? You don't, right? OCD tells you you do. But if we took OCD as advice on things, well, we'd all be pretty screwed, frankly, if, if that was the case. So let's not take the advice of OCD because, you know, it's just, it's, it's a moron. And we're not going to listen to anything that it says. Catherine asked, what causes OCD? Well, we know there's a mix of gen genetics and also environmental factors that happen as well, too. And, um, you know, depending on each person's genetic load toward having or not having OCD and the environmental factors that happen in their life, you may or may not get obsessive compulsive disorder. Samia says, how can you handle the fear without the thoughts? It's too scary to feel. Um, I'm wondering what you mean by that. How can you handle the fear without the thoughts? Uh, or unless the thoughts are things that you do to neutralize the fear. So, Sami, I'm wondering if you've ever done virtual reality. And, you know, there's a cliff in front of you. And though you know that you're on the ground, you, it's very hard to take the step off that cliff because it sure looks like you're going to fall, right? But you logically, absolutely logically know that you are not going to fall because you are, you are solidly on the ground. And eventually you take up the courage and you, you take the step and now you're floating in the air. Or you could be falling too, right? But you're not actually falling, but it looks like you're falling. 
right? What if OCD was like that? What if OCD was kind of a virtual reality that told you all of this stuff and all of these things and how bad everything was when in reality, it's, it's nothing like that whatsoever, but it's tricked you into believing it to be that way. And, and OCD uses a lot of trickery, frankly. Um, and, and I'd like you to work on not believing OCD because uh, OCD does not have your best interest at heart. OCD wants you to do one thing, and that is to do compulsions. And, and if it gets you to do them and it causes great enough fear that it leads you to doing compulsions, it's one. It's done exactly what it wants. And you say, yeah, but I can't handle the fear. And I don't believe that for a second, that you can't handle the fear. I, I 100% believe that you can handle the fear. You have to recognize something, though. And, and I mean this very sincerely to everybody listening. You can only be brave by first feeling afraid. Sami, I want you to be brave. I already know that you're afraid. But now it's time to be brave and to recognize that the fear that you're experiencing is a mirage thrown up at you by obsessive compulsive disorder. And it's designed to get you to do a compulsion. But the reality turns out to be you don't, you don't actually have to pay any attention to it whatsoever. It's just simply not true. Marissa says, can I touch on health anxiety and OCD? Constantly super aware of all sensations. Yes, uh, and Marissa, of course, there's, there's absolutely no way whatsoever to get you to um, think otherwise in, in many ways, right? I mean, you, you're going to keep checking, and every time you check, you're going to find something that feels like um, – that feels like it shouldn't be there, right? And, and that's just the way health anxiety-based OCD is, that nothing ever feels just exactly right. I mean, you know, even if I think about different body parts now, my, my shin, my leg, or my, my hand, you know, I've got, you know, getting older, I get a little arthritis. Not quite right. I mean, how much, how much time should I spend, you know, review seven, eight hours tonight. So maybe another seven, eight hours of thinking about why my finger doesn't quite bend as well as all the other ones do. Stupid arthritis. Um, and, uh, you know, how much time should I put into thinking about that? now? Because if it's one hour or seven, eight hours, I'm, I'm going to get to the same answer. I still don't really know. Maybe I need another couple of hours to think about it. I'm going to accept the fact that I have arthritis and that it's going to probably get worse over time. And as long as it doesn't affect my golf game, I'm happy. But uh, also, it's not that great anyway. So at least it gives me the chance to blame something. Um, but I'm, I'm never, with health anxiety, going to feel 100% awesome. But frankly, I don't have health anxiety, and I also don't feel 100% awesome either. And therefore, I can handle that. It's okay. And so I just want you to recognize as you're going through and you're trying to scan, you're trying to find things, you're always going to find something. And if you're going to use that as proof that there's something really bad or wrong, well, then all of us are screwed because all of us are going to find things and all of us are then going to give the opportunity to do compulsions so that we can try to make it better which maybe will feel instantaneous relief for a moment, but then the cycle goes again and it just goes around and around and around and around. Well, everyone, we are down to uh, 20 seconds of, of the ceiling collapsing and me dying. Uh, I guess I won't be here next Wednesday because I probably won't make it through these next 10 seconds. So goodbye world. It's been wonderful knowing all of you and, um, I, I hope that OCD goes away and that, oh, wait a minute. Oh, we just passed the hour mark. Oh, the ceiling didn't collapse. There's no fire. Huh, look at that. 
My wish is don't make things happen. Well, then I can end this the right way. Hey, it's been great being with you. This is the No CD Wednesday night webinar, and you can download No CD app or do teletherapy with us. And we look forward to working with you, whether you're in the UK or Canada or the United States or Australia. And we do all sorts of stuff with hoarding and BFRBs and ticks and OCD. And uh, even if there's some co-occurring trauma work as well, too. So please check us out or go to nocd.com, set up a call with us. We would love to work with you and help you. All the best, everyone. Your OCD sucks. I hate it. And I'm going to do everything I can to make it go away, just so you know. So be well, everybody. And... Um, Maybe next week the ceiling will collapse on me. Who knows? We'll, we'll see how it goes. I'll see you all later. Bye.